pull things together from a variety of fields. That he doesn't look at things in a very narrow sense. He's a humanist, a scientist, a doctor, but somebody who cares about uh, all levels of the game. In fact, we're going to start by talking about an experience you had in Aspen that helped pull it together intellectually. But let me just say uh, that The End of Illness is available out there. It is a book that will help you in two ways, therefore buy at least two copies, and he will <laughs> sign it. It is uh, like the uh, biography of cancer that, uh, I can't pronounce his last name. Siddhartha Mukherjee. Yeah, wrote very, very <laughs> philosophical <laughs> book about the whole concept of what is health, what is illness. But it's also a very specific book that tells you everything from baby aspirins to vitamin D to sunlight to rest to how to be healthy. And it's not a wacky book. There are books like this that come out all the time that basically tell you if you either eat a lot of gluten or no gluten, you will live for 100. <laughs> and finally, it's a book that has been the number one bestseller on the, you know, every list around. So, David, a friend of Aspen, thanks for being back, sir. Thank you, Walter. And speaking of a friend of Aspen, so you go to Aspen, you're hanging around, you meet... Um, uh, Murray Gelman, and this helps provoke this book. So Aspen set up a session for Murray Gelman to interview me on cancer. Yeah, Murray Gelman, for those who don't know, lives in Aspen, but won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the quark, and is basically a quantum mechanical physicist and great theorist, but also a polymath, I think, meaning he knows everything. But he won the Nobel Prize in 1969. Yeah. I mean, that's what's wild. Yeah. But someone like this we started talking and he started quizzing me on cancer for the session we were doing. And we were talking deeper and deeper. And then he started explaining to me how he came about the quark. You know, he theorized something existed without any data, just by approaching it from tangential sides. And he started to talk about complex systems of which he really was a pioneer in. And he started to ask questions. Why do you care what the individual gene does when cancer in the body are a complex system? And he made me think differently. So it's an astonishing thing to say, but because of Aspen Institute, I mean, this book really came about. So I owe it a debt of gratitude to you, Walter, to the Institute, and it made an enormous impact on me, so much so that the government actually gave Murray and I this $20 million grant to start to model cancer as a complex system, which the Aspen Times, in its wisdom, put it out as a $250 million grant when it announced it. So we were very excited, but it was only a... <laughs> No, it's good, and I know you start the book by mentioning being out in Aspen at a dinner party. Whose dinner party was it, by the way? <laughs> Jerry Hoser of your yes, Door okay. Hoser Institute. So, right, yes. right. I remember uh, when um, Jerry Hoser was seeking you out because, mm -hmm. uh, among other things, you helped both uh, Door and Hoser, I think, with prostate uh, mm -hmm. cancer family issues. So, uh, anyway, uh, you, you, you actually begin the book with a rumination on what is health. Explain why you do that. So... You know, Schrodinger wrote a book, you know, in the 1930s called What is Life? And it really was the foundation for the biotechnology industry. So I was originally going to call the book What is Health as an homage to that. And it really goes to the science of what is health? Is it your cholesterol? Is it how you feel? Is it how old you are? Is it how you sleep? How do you define health? We really don't have a metric for it. So if you look at an engineer, they say, listen, I optimized the system on X, Y, or Z. Well, if you don't know what health is, how are you going to optimize your life, your therapy, what you do, your activities? Mm -hmm. We don't have a definition of health. So what is a good definition of health? Well, I mean, I think that's what we have to evolve to. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's going to be uh, some of the things that we know where there's real data behind. Mm -hmm. And so data behind inflammation, data behind preventing disease, data behind strategies to live into your 90s that we can talk about, but it really is going to where there's data from studies. You know, you spend a lot of time talking about inflammation. Explain yes. why you look at that as something key. You know, inflammation is the root of heart disease, cancer, neurodegeneration, and we know that. There are studies over 30, 40 decades looking at that. And in fact, ways to modulate inflammation, relatively simple, have the most dramatic effect in health of anything we've seen. Things like aspirin, if you saw the New York Times last week, front page, 35% reduction in cancer by taking a baby, baby aspirin a day. Well, that is profound. If you calculate that out, that's $120 billion savings a year to the U.S. government if every citizen over the age of 40 took an aspirin. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's wild. Statins, the biggest class of drug in history, was developed to lower cholesterol, but their dominant mechanism is lowering inflammation. 
So much so that if you take someone with a normal cholesterol and put them on a statin, you will delay heart attack and stroke by 13 years. So what are statins compared to aspirins? They're different ways of modulating inflammation. And it goes to the root, which is really you know, hard to admit, but we don't really have a way of measuring inflammation. We have one poor man's metric called C-reactive protein. So again, if I want to optimize a system, optimize a way of doing things, I should be able to measure it. And we never even tried to do it. So what's astonishing to me, and this is where I get in trouble all the time, is that the US government, the NIH is a fantastic organization. They, they support me, and I love them. But if, 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 the, if we Anybody announce... Anybody here from the NIH? <laughs> no, OK, we're safe. But uh, uh, Yeah, so you go, you're going beyond the butt now. But if we, if we announced last week the 35% reduction in cancer with an aspirin, and this data is not new. I mean, my book came out in January, and we talked about the data. So it's years old. There is not one grant in the NIH looking at who should be on aspirin, looking at preventing the side effects of aspirin, osp- uh, optimizing aspirin. What is the right dosage? We all say a baby aspirin, but maybe 100 milligrams is better than 81. We're not doing any of that. So one of the most profound drugs we have, we're not even trying to and make it better. And why? Because there's no in- economic incentive? Because we're a reductionist group in science. We want to understand one gene, one pathway. We want to understand things. It's all about the fundamentals of understanding. Rather than thinking like an engineer, which will say, listen, a complex emergent system, I can't always understand, but I can control it. Mm -hmm. So there's data. Aspirin can somehow change your system toward health. Understanding it, eh, it doesn't really matter that much. I want to understand how EGFR signals and how we can block it. That's where the money goes. And I'm guilty as anybody else. I mean, I was one of the heads of the Cancer Genome Project. All great and good to do that, spending a couple of billion dollars, but where did it get us? The average cancer on diagnosis is 130 mutations. Mm-hmm. I can't model that. I can't target that. Mm-hmm. So um, when you talk about it being a complex system that can't really be modeled and targeted, but an engineer could do it, that really does get into what the Santa Fe Institute, what Murray does. but. Explain what a complex system is to you. So when you make one change, everything else changes. Mm. And in medicine, you know, we look at one node. We say, listen, your vitamin D is low, so take vitamin D. Let's correct that node. And what you don't realize is it changes the whole system. And so since we're not measuring the system, we're just measuring that one node, when you make these changes, most of the time in medicine, we've gotten it wrong how it changed the system. Remember, I'm the same profession that in 1970 said, take margarine, not butter, and we killed a couple of million of people by doing that. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we tried to change one node. It didn't work. Now, you mentioned vitamin D, and that is a lot about vitamin D in your book. Yes. Uh, uh, Is it something very specific we should think about vitamin D? And um, does the supplements, I know you're not, you, you worry about people overdosing by saying, let me just go out and take vitamin D pills, right. uh, as somebody who tans easily, is it best just to go outside? Well, remember, the only reason you tan is to block vitamin D absorption. So right there, yeah. it's a freaking clue from somebody upstairs that you know, too much of this is bad. Right. So 97% of African Americans are, quote, low in vitamin D, 81% of Caucasians. So first of all, who defined what normal is? I look at this and say, you know, listen, if you're low in vitamin D, you don't get rickets. So what really is low? If you take a woman 70 years of age and older and give them a large dose of vitamin D so it raises their vitamin D for a year, 26% increase in bone fractures, not decrease, increase. If a woman, and this is 29,000 women studied. Is that because they're getting too much? No, it's because you take a lot, you downregulate the receptor, you screw up signaling. So you say, well, let's give Uh, a small amount. It's a complex system. Yeah. You give a small amount every day. So they did that in the Women's Health Study. 29,000 women, a calcium and vitamin D pills every day. So does it decrease bone fractures? No. Does it dramatically increase kidney stones? Yes. Does it cause indigestion? Yes. So no benefit. But then there's this notion of mixing off associations and causality. Right. It's true. People with lower vitamin D have higher cancer and heart disease. People, smokers have lower vitamin D. People who are obese have lower vitamin D. That doesn't mean giving vitamin D makes that problem better. Yet we just throw it at it. It's an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I was editor of Time Magazine, I used to love the fact, with all due respect, that we could do a cover saying, you know, no butter, eat margarine. And then the next year, of course, we could, you know, sell even more copies by saying no margarine, do olive oil. (laughs) And eggs, good for you, bad for you, cholesterol, good. 
I would suspect you probably could, since you do in the book, list a hundred headlines I've seen telling me to take vitamin D and, a hundred, and 70 telling me not to take vitamin D. So I look at it this way. There have been 63 studies in the history of mankind where we've had more than a thousand people in a randomized study with vitamins or supplements. Mm -hmm. And so the NIA has compiled all of them. There has yet to be one that has ever been positive. There has not been one that has ever been positive. On D or any vitamin? On any vitamin or supplement. In vitamin D, the two large randomized studies, and these studies were over $200 million to do, again, no benefit to taking them. So I look at this, and you know, Vita is life, therefore vitamins are good for you. It's got the greatest branding in the world. Yet remember, all a vitamin is is something the body can't synthesize enough of. It doesn't mean more is better. So they do a study in men, and they say, listen, let's give 400 units of vitamin E a day to prevent prostate cancer. You know, all of men get it, everybody's taking it. So 400 units is what's in a multivitamin. If a man takes that for three years, his rate of prostate cancer is 17% elevated. And it lasts, that elevation, for four years after stopping. So again, you look at this, and this was a $240 million study our government did. So you would think after doing this and putting a quarter billion dollars out there, the government would say, listen, if we increase prostate cancer by 17% a year, that's $60 billion to our bottom line, we should outlaw vitamin E in men. I haven't seen that, that, that legislation yet. And why yet. not? <laughs> I mean, what, what, what's preventing, is there some insidious reason? You know, I, again, I think we're a society where we don't like to be uh, prescriptive. Right. And we don't like to restrict things. When I look at people like Michael Dell, who says, listen, you are welcome to smoke a Dell computer, but I'm going to charge two and a half times the health insurance costs if you smoke. Mm -hmm. And so we need to actually have culpability in health care. Health care is 16.5% of GDP in the United States, and it's growing. Mm -hmm. And unless we do something, we're not going to get a change there. And so we say, well, there's health care reform. Health care reform isn't health care reform. It's health care finance, finance reform. And to be honest, I don't care about health care finance. I care about health care. Health care and food are 31% of the U.S. economy. I have yet to see a candidate mention those. Right. And it's surprising to me that it's 31% of the U.S. economy and at least 31% of our health. It comes from nutrition and food in terms of are we healthy or not healthy depends on what we eat. And yet, uh, having, once again, going back to my experience at Time magazine, I still don't quite know whether or not I should take a one-a-day multiple vitamin, whether I should have sal put salt on my food or avoid salt totally, whether or not I should use butter versus margarine, whether shrimp are good for well, me. Well, no, 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 Dan, Oysters. you better know, yeah. because, I mean, I, you got to ask the question, has yeah. there been a study to show it's a benefit, because these are drugs. Right. If a woman takes a multivitamin, this was a, a 29,000 yeah. women study, again, and they looked at women who took multivitamins versus not. Well, it turns out the women who took multivitamins were actually lower body mass index, less diabetes, 15% higher death rate in women who took multivitamins. But so is that a correlation with taking the multivitamin, or is it just again, people who are so, naughty enough to so buy them? This, yeah. this is the classic thing. Is, well, the onus is, well, maybe the study was done wrong. Again, I put the onus the other direction. Yeah. Show me a positive study first before you take a pill. Mm -hmm. I know many drugs where there are positive studies, yet we're not doing it, a la the aspirin and the statins, etc. Mm -hmm. Yet we're all doing these vitamins because we feel empowered. The more you spend, the better. There's something missing. Let me run back to statins and stuff. I, of course, take a baby aspirin every day for a few years now since this came out in your book. Right. I, it never occurred to me until I read your book that I should ask my doctor about statins. Should yes. I? Yes, and so, you know, I got vilified by, you know, these, these lobbies. You know, I, I, I got vilified by people. I'm supporting the pharma industry. I'm a shill of the pharma industry. A 90-day supply of a statin at Walmart without health insurance is $9. Mm -hmm. So I want you to ask the question. I'm not telling you to go on it in the question because they did a study called the Jupiter study, 20-plus thousand people with a normal cholesterol, 175 and below, who took a statin a day. It delayed heart attack and stroke by over a decade. Mm -hmm. Reduce the incidence of cancers. And you do it as a, a supplement to aspirin, or they both so, sort of do the same thing? Both separately affect these diseases. Because remember, three weeks, in the last three weeks, there have been three separate studies that will tell us that Alzheimer's will be a disease of the past over the next decade. Will be a disease of the past. So I want to be in a delay mode going forward. And the way to delay is block inflammation, do the right kinds of exercise. Take care of yourself. Don't take these pills that are going to potentially harm your health, that are basically a crapshoot. It's going to Vegas, taking a pill without any data behind it. 
Speaking of Alzheimer's, I see George Bradenburg here who I'll let him ask, break in and ask a question because George, among the many, many things he's done in life, you also run something on Alzheimer's, right? The, I do. What's it called? Us Against Alzheimer's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Like yeah, yeah. So you're against Alzheimer's, is what you're saying? <laughs> shocking. Yeah, it's shocking. We've done a study. We're against it. Yeah. Uh, I'd be curious as to what whether you think we can get to the end of Alzheimer's in 10 years and what it will take to get us there. So the, 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 the first study that came out was this wild study. We used to think Alzheimer's was a disease of the brain. Well, it turns out it's not. And they did this by taking some cells that may tau the abnormal protein and putting it in one spot in the brain, and then sacrificing the mouse a couple of weeks later, and the proteins that caused the Alzheimer's were all over the brain. So it's the disease of a couple of cells, not a disease of the brain. And also, all of a sudden, we have an animal model to study this disease. Because before, we had to give a drug to a patient for a decade and say, did it slow the disease? Now we've got a way to do it, literally in real time. And then a clever group took a drug that's FDA-approved for lymphoma that affects folding a protein. And they said, listen, let's give it to a mouse with Alzheimer's. Well, a mouse, if you drop in a napkin, it rips up the napkin, makes the nest, and it sits there. If you give a mouse Alzheimer's, it sits in a corner and does nothing. You give this drug to a mouse with Alzheimer's, two days later, it's making a nest again. You sacrifice the mouse and look in the brain, 60% of that abnormal protein has gone away. And you know that when things are published, they actually happen about a year before. So when things are published, Many other things are happening behind the scenes that will then come out. And so there are drugs now that are going to be able to change the paradigm here. And so, again, I want to be in delay mode. I'm an optimist, and I get to see what's under the curtain, and it's good. Uh, uh, lycopene. Is that how you say it? Or lycopene. 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 Yes. Also in your book. Obviously, I've read the book but not pronounced. I didn't, read, I didn't hear the audio version. Uh, <laughs> uh, tell us about that. So lycopene is a compound. It's a classic example where... the there was a study done showing an association when people who eat foods with higher amounts of lycopene actually... tomato-ish stuff. Tomatoes, watermelon, and so they actually have a better outcome with some cancers. So, you know, everybody wants to sell something, and so they sell the lycopene pills. And what do you know? When you take the pills, there's no effect. Mm -hmm. Again, because there are different forms of these compounds. And what happens in nature, there's something special. The great story is 1746, James Lind is captain of the British Royal Navy. And he wins the Battle of Trafalgar because he had limes in his ship. Because back then, when you were at sea for weeks at a time, your, your soldiers got scurvy. When you had the limes, they didn't. And he, like any good entrepreneur, says, and I happen to sell the extract of lime at his end of his book. Well, in the textbook of medicine in the early 1900s, they kill so-called scurvy and infectious disease. Why? As soon as you squeeze that lime, everything degrades. And you're not having real vitamin C or any nutrients. It degrades with hundreds of a millisecond. So that's why you need to eat real food, not the pills, not the juicing, and everything we want to do quick and easy, the real food. And get a load of this. I mean, this is the wildest data that, again, I don't know why we're not pushing out there. If you have your lunch today at noon and tomorrow at 2 o'clock, for two hours, stress hormones goes up because your body is expecting food. When that happens, metabolism goes down. You actually gain weight. You lose about 28% in cognition and about 34% in uh, uh, exercise function. So regularity and schedule can make you good to great. Yet all we do is we say, eat the right food. It's not just what you eat, it's how you eat it. And then we have these classes of food. Well, I have organic. And remember, as soon as something is picked from a tree, it starts degrading to put its nutrients back in the soil. So organic food is awesome, but it's been sitting at the fancy grocer for three days. It has zero nutritional value. So what about fresh? So you need to say what came in fresh today, or if you can't do that, get flash frozen. But the notion of just because it has this class, it's organic and it came from a good farm, is great. But if it's been there a couple of days or was shipped in from South America, it's not going to have nutritional value. So in some ways, eating flash-frozen vegetables may be better for you. Oh, no question about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's know where your food is from. Ask the question. In Europe, they have what came in fresh that day. Mm -hmm. We need to get back to the mentality where if you can't, do the flash-frozen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, let's go back to Aspen for a moment. Yes. Lance Armstrong. Yeah. So, I mean, 1997, remember there's this kid who has germ cell tumor, the brain, the lung, and the liver. He goes to the best cancer centers in the country, and they tell him, listen, chemotherapy is going to make you sick. Go back to where you're from in Texas. Spend your last couple months with your family. Well, this kid says, you know, and this is before the Internet when you can Google things. He got a letter from a doctor, a handwritten letter, saying, hey, you want to consider Indianapolis because there's a clinical trial there. 
And there's a clinical trial there of platinum, the same thing in my wedding band here. Why? Because some goofball doc, and I use that term endearingly, <laughs> put two electrodes in a gel and said, do cancer cells like electricity or not? And it turns out they didn't care about the electricity, but some of the platinum killed some of the cells, so they gave it intravenously to patients like Lance. A year and a half later, he wins his first of seven tours de France. Mm -hmm. Powerful there, right? I don't know how platinum works. I don't know why it works. Somehow it disrupted that complex system that cancer didn't like it. So Lance now, you know, to me, cancer's a verb. He was cancering. And so how can I move from a cancering state to a health state? Things like aspirin can help do it. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I get in fights with Lance all the time because I say, you know, Lance, you've got to come in and have your blood drawn. And he says, well, David, if you take a tube of blood, it's six seconds off my time. And, uh, you know, going on an aspirin, if I fall, I can bleed. And so, you know, we need to temper with, you know, you've got to choose your metric, Lance. you want to live until your 90s and play with your grandchildren? Or do you want to have your optimal performance in a race down in Panama or wherever it happens to be? And you've got to choose that. Remember, the United States, we spent $2.3 billion last year on growth hormone in people who are not short stature. Right. If I gave a six-year-old growth hormone, they're going to look fantastic. They're going to feel fantastic. Their friends are going to pat on the back and say, you're doing great. Well, they're going to live 13 years shorter. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's what's their metric? Do they care about what they feel like today? Or do they really want to live till their 90s and play with their grandkids? But you know, you make that seem like an obvious question, but the answer is not obvious. No, I mean, it's your value system. I mean, again, if you want to make that decision. I mean, it gets you back to what is health. Right, but it's. It, it, is it living beyond 90, or is it having an optimum performance for 60 years? Right, but I mean, my goal is to have an optimum performance for 90 years. Okay, good. But it's also, I mean, you, what is the effect on society of doing these things? Yeah. Right? If you today skipped your flu shot this year and you got the flu, a decade from now, your rate of heart disease and cancer are 10 and 12% elevated mm -hmm. because of the inflammation associated with flu. Mm -hmm. So you say, listen, it's my right not to get that flu shot. I think the flu shots are going to cause autism in my neighbor's <laughs> children, so I'm not going to get it. <laughs> and so you skip it. But society has to, when you get Medicare, we have to pay mm -hmm. for your heart disease and cancer. Mm -hmm. Does that seem right? Now, you, uh, w let's go back to inflammation because you've mentioned it again. I think of inflammation because I had a, you know, a knee right. uh, replacement. So it's inflamed for a few months mm -hmm. and then down. But you're using inflammation in a much um, so, more technical sense. Yeah, inflammation is, you know, it, you saw what happened in your knee. It got red and it hurt a little bit. Well, you think of all the arteries in your bodies are the same. And remember, your body was engineered and optimized through evolution to have good children, right? It's evolution, it's having kids is why we've been selected out. It doesn't care who lives till their 90s. Correct. And so when you get inflammation, your body says, hey, listen, something's wrong. I got to deal with that. I don't care about things like cancer because it's a decade from when that mutation happens to when the cancer manifests itself by death. And so the body says, hey, I care about today, not tomorrow. And so you lose those things. And so by not blocking that inflammation and your body really focusing on what's going on that moment, you harm yourself in the long run. And so we now can I optimize have both. My knee operation? No, it's great because okay. it reduces inflammation. <laughs> okay. Right? That inflammation is bad. Yeah. You know, I made this you know, statement in the book that I get all this you know, uh, 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 negative from my wife because I said, you know, when you wear high heels, there's a negative there. Yeah. And so what I meant is, is that when you wear shoes that cause pain, that's inflammation. Mm -hmm. And over time, that causes a problem. So I want you to be comfortable. Here's my last question before we'll go here, yeah. which is, uh, molecular targeted therapies in cancer, you've been a pioneer on. Yeah, and by the way, you know, I'm a believer in it. I think it's awesome. You had the best analogy in the book from Steve that I, I, I hadn't heard before. We talked about walking lily pad to lily pad. Yeah. And I, I really believe it's a beautiful analogy. Is that, you know, we now, for all the technology we have, we can start to look at drugs that really target one pathway and change the system in a, drugs, in a direction that we want to do it. And so we have the technology now, we have the ability to, and we're starting to make impacts. Remember, the death rate from cancer from 1950 till today is only down 8%. Mm -hmm. So we're not much better at treating cancer than we were. Yeah, that entire New York, what did you think of that New York Times series a year ago, just saying, hey, we haven't gotten anywhere in the I cancer think it's war? Great. I mean, I think it was unfortunately a little bit too negative and not pushing the positive side of things. Yeah. But you know, you gotta say why. Yeah. And you gotta take a step back and say, listen, if we've done all these things wrong, maybe we gotta take that step back. So we're at a new era in treating disease where we can really start to do things in a way that makes sense instead of just throwing drugs out there. We can start to say the right drug for the right patient, mm -hmm. and we're going to change things over the next decade. That's why we've got to prevent disease so we can get there. 
Uh, Dan Glickman. Yes. Uh, doctor, I read your book. It's terrific. Thank you. Uh, I have two quick questions for you. So you prescribe aspirin and statins. What do you take in terms of supplements, if any? And then my next question is, is that the old French philosopher said the expression, you are what you eat. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I didn't see a lot of advice on what to eat in your book, except eat locally. And you talk a little bit about the organic versus the non-organic thing. But if, if food is the primary way you get nutrients mm -hmm. and it's better than pills. What should you eat? Well, let's let's take a step back from okay. that because and, it's and not also I'm interested what you most should take. So, so. Well, let's answer that separately because you know the notion of what you eat. I mean, as Walter alluded to, there are a lot of freaking goofball diet books out there, and there is no way to answer that question. So we're learning what we call dimensionalities to health. So it turns out that the incidence of prostate cancer and breast cancer are one tenth in China than here, and we think, well, it's in the Burger King, McDonald's. It turns out it's not. No offense, but you have tenfold more bacteria in your body than you do cells in the body. These bacteria control how you metabolize your food and your hormone levels. And so I can't tell you what to eat because I don't know your microbiome, which are the bacteria in your body. And again, it's a complex system. There's no one size fits all. But what I can say is you want to have meals on a regular schedule. So it doesn't matter if you have three or six a day. It's the regularity that's key. It's the person who randomly grabs, randomly grabs an apple during the day that hurts themselves. Mm. Grabbing an apple every day at the same time is key. And that goes to when you get up and when you go to bed. 600 kids in each arm. 600 kids, they said to the parents, go to bed whenever you want, wake up in 10 and a half hours. 600 kids go to bed at the same time, wake up 10 and a half hours later. 27% improvement in cognition on cognitive tests in the latter group. Regularity takes you from good to great. Um, in terms of food, you want what's fresh, you want to go where there's data. Right? What do you know if you force feed a chicken corn, the oils in that egg aren't good for you? If you let a chicken run free range and eat good vegetarian food, what do you know? The oils are good for you. What we know is, is that we were wrong in the 70s. A low fat diet is not healthy. The healthy thing is a good fat diet. And so things like cold water wild fish, chicken, some beef, totally taken out of context the study that was on the front page of the New York Times last week on beef. If you look at that study, what that study said is that a half a serving a day on average of beef had no negative effects at all. Anything more than that had a decrement. It didn't look into the difference between people who eat lots of beef are normally more obese, or all beef the same, yet it said all beef bad. Those kind of declarations make no sense. So the key is moderation, some of everything. In terms of what I take, it's very simple. I do an aspirin a day. I do a real aspirin. 81 milligrams of baby aspirin. Baby aspirin. I do enteric coated because it's safer. Mm -hmm. And I do a statin, a low dose of a statin, even though I have a normal cholesterol. You know, I had a genetic test that said I'm a slightly higher risk for heart disease. And that's a great example. We launched the book. We did a nightline where Bill Weir, the nightline anchor, came oh, into my oh, office. Yeah. Live on TV, we sequenced his DNA. He was higher risk for heart disease. So live on TV, we did a heart scan, and he's got a big lesion in the LED, the big artery in his heart. And he would have had a heart attack in one to five years. The next morning, American Heart Association said, egg is screwed up. He wasn't eligible for screening. It shouldn't have been done. And I said, are you serious? <laughs> then your criteria are wrong because he was positive. They said, well, if you allow screening in everybody like this, there's going to be chaos in our country. I go, well, good, because then there's going to be a push to develop better technologies and higher throughput technologies. What does it cost to do a heart scan and screening? What is the retail price of a heart scan in the country today? Anywhere from $79 to $99. What does one heart attack cost a company in the United States today for an employee? $79,000. So again, I, I, I'm missing something there. So I take the aspirin and the statin. I do drink red wine. Um, I think that if you look at the data, there probably, although not definitively, are some benefits there. It raises the HDL, the good cholesterol. And the interesting thing that I did with red wine that I believe in, I'm, I'm a believer in data. So, you know, the problem with wine is that it's a depressant. You have too much of it, you go to sleep. Four or five hours later, you wake up because you get a rebound in the stimulating hormones in the body. So I have one of these little devices. So, you know, I, I followed me and I, I looked at my sleep. And I, I saw, listen, if I have one glass of wine, I sleep great. If I have two glasses, I don't sleep that well. So I don't have more than a glass and a half of red wine a night. <laughs> Compromise a little on the sleep and yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's good. Yeah. Oh, I eat food, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, food with the red wine. Yes, give her the uh, microphone. Yes. Well, I thank you very, very much for all of this. I'm sure. a cancer survivor, but I'm interested in your, the term inflammation, uh, especially with tintinitis. I have dear friends who suffer from this. Is this something you can comment on or 
give a little... Uh, so tinnitus. Tinnitus, the ringing in the ears. Yeah, so what, you know, what do you think? Tinnitus uh, is something that has been around, we know, documented since the 1500s. Sure. It's real. It seems to be an inflammation around the neurons in the ear. Sometimes there's a cause and we can affect it, and other times it just happens. So again, I will go back to you know, optimizing everything else in your life. And you know, there's no miracle cure that I know of for untreatable tinnitus, but certainly optimize everything else, which is the key really to health. How do you find doctors as yourself here in the local area? I mean, do you have your own blog? Do you have a I'm blog really for us? Yeah. I, I think you, know, you, have to, you have to research. You know, when you buy a car, you go to Consumer Reports, you go on the web, you talk to friends who've driven it. I want you to do the same thing about doctors. I mean, I want you really to push. And that pushing, it's a free market, are going to make doctors better. Yes, uh, I saw the hand right there, yes. My, my question to you is, you're saying that everyone should individualize their own health, but you're also recommending aspirin and statins to people. Sort no, of. no, I'm not recommending. I'm saying okay. everybody should talk to their doctor about okay. aspirins and statins. Because I want the they, conversation they to happen. They also do have side effects. No question about it. And okay. I, that's a great point. Okay. I'm not telling anybody to take them. I want the conversations to happen because all too often that doctor makes a decision without going to risks and benefits for you. So statins, the real side effects, we saw them in the paper last week or a couple weeks ago is that, yes, they increase the rate of diabetes. But look at the data, right? So they increase the rate of diabetes in about 1 in 200 people. Every person who went on to get diabetes started the study with a high sugar level. Who benefited the most from being on statins? The people who went in with a high sugar level. Actually lived longer taking these statins, even though it pushed them toward diabetes. And so, again, I think you need to discuss that data and look at them as an individual. It can cause everything the statins cause is reversible. So part of it is you try it. If you have a side effect, you stop it because then it's not a zero-sum game. Because I think your marketing does, you know, everyone's saying, I think that's something important that's not getting through with the marketing of this book. You read the... No question about it. Is that you want to have those discussions. Because you say statins, aspirin, and no vitamins. I think it's just, it's a little... I want the discussion. I agree with you. I want the discussions to happen. I'm not making any recommendations for anybody. One other question, just to follow up. There are so many other people here first, the back, and then that person in the back, and then here, and... Um, I'm very interested in this whole aspect of inflammation. Yes. And so you take a C reactive protein test and you Mm -hmm. get a very high score. Mm -hmm. This happened to me. And then you try to figure out what's the problem. And so they say, well, we can't tell you what the problem is. We just took the test. We know there's inflammation. What should you be doing after that? It's a great question. So first is you've got to look for a root cause and then try to change as much as you can to lower that inflammation. So, you know, exercise. And our notion of exercise in this country is wrong, right? It's an hour at the gym and then you sit the rest of the day. If you look at the data, and this is from American Heart Association, sitting the rest of the day is equivalent to smoking a pack and a half of cigarettes in terms of its health detriment. So you need to move during the day. Moving during the day lowers C-reactive protein. You need to fight harder to find out why it's elevated. If it really is elevated, and I don't know your case, there's a reason there, and you've got to figure it out. And so, push harder. Yeah, the gentleman way back there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello. I have a two-part question. Uh, your opinion on radiated food plus this pink slime that we're hearing about, and also juicing, what benefits? So, so juicing is easy. Is juicing that, is easy and in the book, yes. Throw out the juicer. Is that, you know, again, as soon as you put something in a juicer, you lose most of the nutrients in milliseconds. Because so, the oxygen hits it, it. It, it, Oxygen, the perturbation, these are very, you know, these are sensitive chemicals. You know, they oxidize, they degrade right away. And so don't juice, eat the real food. In terms of pink slime, you know, this was, so pink slime is this meat, composite, if you will, <laughs> that is mixed with um, uh, 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 chemicals that actually make it so it doesn't degrade. And so it was used by a number of uh, 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 low-end burger places and other places in order to get consistency in the burgers and things. We don't know any negative health outcome because nobody's ever studied it. But certainly what we know is that you want to know where your food is from. So don't, don't eat pink slime if you can help it. <laughs> eat good food. Certainly the grass-fed beef, there's data that grass-fed beef actually improves cardiac outcome. And so eat real food, know where it's from, and know about it is the key here. And the key is moderation. Again, red meat, no more than a half a serving a day. Yes, the gentleman way in the back. I'm sorry, but you really are spawning a lot of questions, and I think over here too. But uh, yeah. 
A little bit more about exercise, if you would. Uh, how sure. much uh, and what types cardio weights? And so, uh, is it, does it depend a better time of day than another time of day? So 1953, Jeremiah Morris writes a paper that will never be repeated, but it's one of the great papers in science that wasn't referenced for four decades. And he looked at the 26,500 workers in the British Transit Authority. Half were the bus drivers that sat 90% of the day, and half the ticket takers that walked around and took the tickets. Heart attack rate and death rate, 60% less than the ticket takers compared to the bus drivers. Cancer rate, less. They weighed the same. They lived in the same neighborhoods. They ate the same. It's moving during the day. So Nike has this new device that looks at the percentage of time you move during the day. And that's powerful. So looking at the data, I love that you go to the gym for an hour a day, but I want you to move during the day. It's a sign of respect. I mean, you know it from Steve. Is when he had his meetings, he went for walks. It's a sign of respect. All my interviews, almost, <laughs> when he could, were walks. Yeah. Yeah. And with sign of respect, you say to someone, let's go for a walk. You know, companies that built the garages right next to the desks makes no sense. <laughs> you know, get up, move around during the day, go to the copy machine, move as much as you can to get that health benefit. In terms of what exercises, obviously you want to do some aerobics and core, C-O-R-E. Really build that core. Things like yoga are fantastic because they stretch you and they do it in a safe fashion that you don't cause harm. Um, my name is Paula Gordon. I have a website called Gordon uh, um, Cancer Prevent uh, Gordon Cancer Theory dot com. Uh-huh. Let me communicate about this. Uh, I wanted to sh- share with you an NIH uh, study that um, was done in the seventies. Um, they had a um, um, a symposium on the spontaneous remission of cancer, and the there was a commonality on all the cases, anecdotal cases, clinical cases that were were reported on. Uh, things like um, malaria, uh, septicemia, uh, cobra bite, all had the effect of regressing cancer. And I wondered... um, uh, So you make a very good point. So 1898, Cooley um, made something called Cooley's toxin at Sloan Kettering in Rockefeller University where he took bacteria, he boiled them, and he injected them into people. A third of the people died when he injected it. A third of the people, the cancer progressed and did nothing to it. And some of the people actually got better. And so, again, I look at it as a complex system. So you change the system. Somehow in some patient, that cancer may say, hey, I don't like this system. So there was a trial done 10 years ago that really is important. What they did is they took women after optimal breast cancer therapy, and they gave half a placebo and half a drug that builds bone, an osteoporosis drug. And it reduced the recurrence of the breast cancer by over 40%. From the notion you change the soil, the seed doesn't grow because breast cancer likes to go to bone. And so, again, if we change the system in the right direction, we can have a benefit. And we're going to hear all these cases of people went on radical diets, and some of them probably did get better, but most of them went the other direction. And so the key is to try to study that in a scientific fashion and understand this system. You know, the problem is, is that, you know, look at it, this complex system. You've got inputs. It's what you eat. It's your genetics. It's how you exercise. And the output's how you feel. Well, that middle state function, it's been hidden. And all of a sudden now we have the technology to look at it. The cover of the book is the picture of all the proteins in the body, the proteome. That's the state function. That's what's happening that moment in time. And so now we can make these interventions and say, who does it benefit, who doesn't it benefit? How would you relate, how would you relate inflammation to immune status? There are a couple of cancers where immunology can help, the immune system can help, and those have what we call the, the immune recognition molecules, and those are kidney cancer and melanoma. In other cancers, immune therapy hasn't really benefited. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you feel about calcium and calcium with vitamin D? Well, the, the women's health study, 26,000 women studied with calcium and vitamin D supplements, no effect on bone fracture at all. And so, again, I look at it and say, listen, you're taking a pill a day that has side effects, increased kidney stones, increased stomach upset because it binds the acid in your stomach, and what's the benefit? And so I go back to, I want you to ask your doctor, where's a randomized study that for me this will be a benefit? So I'm not telling anybody to stop it, but I want those discussions to happen because I'm missing something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thanks. Um, I I wanna ask you about uh, the sort of, the the, uh, delivery system here, and the delivery system I'm talking about is medical education. Um, I grew up in a household physician, professor of medicine, ran a medical research institute. All his friends were the same. 
and it was astonishing how much they knew about cardiology and pulmonology and nephrology, et cetera, and how, how barren uh, they were in their knowledge of uh, uh, the other things that affect our health. And my question is, um, to get your sense of the current state of medical education as it relates to uh, sort of how's your health-related factors and the prospects that, that's, that that can find its way into uh, medical education. So at the Aspen Institute last year, we did a session on medical education where they had three deans of medical schools, and very prestigious ones, University of Pennsylvania, Harvard, and Michigan, I think, and me. And all three deans... <laughs> He's at USC, if you're wondering, but yeah. All three deans argued we have to get rid of prerequisites. You know, let the kids really focus on science and get better. They don't need to do math and physics. And I'm like, are you serious? Yeah. You, you know, they learn how to think. They learn creativity. we got to get away from that. And then I go to something that Walter is very familiar with, is that, um, you know, the education of the secondary schools. And, uh, uh, you know, Kennedy, when he said we're going to put a man on the moon, people thought he was crazy. Well, nine years later, Neil Armstrong steps on the moon. What was the average age of missile command when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon? 27, which means those kids were 18 years old when Kennedy made his proclamation. So I did, and you know, pushed from friends of Walter, I went to see this guy, Sal Khan, K-H-A-N, who manages these, these low-tech videos for kids in education. And we did a half a dozen on cancer as a complex system, on vitamins, all the things we talk about today. You know, within a month, a quarter million views of this. I'm going back tomorrow morning and do another half dozen videos mm -hmm. of them. Kids get it. Um, they get it, and we have to respect that. You know, we push kids, and well, they have to learn the endoplasmic reticulum and the nucleus and the cell membrane, most of which is in those textbooks, unfortunately, is wrong. And, you know, while it's interesting, it's phenomenology, it's an artifact of sometimes, you know, 100 years that just get propagated. We need to teach them how to think and to approach science from a problematic sense of view, not memorizing facts. I want them to think. I want them to get excited. There's a great Ed Rocher painting that says, Science is truth found out. Mm -hmm. And I certainly believe that, and most of the truths we haven't found yet. Yes, sir. Right. Science is truth found out. Love that. I don't want to make this sound like drug addiction terms, but for those of us who have been taking multivitamins <laughs> for years and years, do you recommend getting off them cold turkey, <laughs> holding on to some? What are the effects? What can we expect? You know, I mean, I, I get hate mail. I mean, literally. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a cancer doctor. And I've never gotten a negative email in my life. I now get a thousand a week of people, you know, aggressive campaigns against me. I have protesters from a talk I gave in San Francisco. They're the nicest protesters in the world. They bought a copy of the book. They had me signed it, and then they picketed yeah. afterwards. Um, so, if you, any protesters, they're good ones to have. But yeah, it's a crutch, right? You've been leaning on it. And so stop cold turkey. There's no data it's beneficial. And again, the caveat is, is that women who are pregnant, certainly prenatal vitamins make all the sense in the world. If you're a vegetarian, have a very out there diet, maybe there is a benefit. But have those discussions with your doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right here. Sorry, I'm trying to. I, I, it's amazing. We had Dr. Brzezinski here. I couldn't get a raised hand for the life of me. And I realized. I didn't have to work today. I should have just let everybody ask the question. I'd like to hear more about the protonomics that you mentioned, the individual, yeah. individualized medicine, and also if you have a known genetic marker with the genome, does that tell you anything? Um, the proteomics first. So pro, you know, omics is study of, proteo is protein. So genomics, study of genes, proteomics, study of proteins. So you know, the first proteomic test came in 1976. So in 1975, if you thought you were pregnant as a woman, you went to a hospital, we took a tube of blood from you, we injected in you into a rabbit, the tube of blood, and five days later, we sacrificed that rabbit. If the rabbit's ovaries were enlarged, you were pregnant. Well, the next year, 1977, Warner Shilka came out with a $10 pregnancy test. Rabbits of the world rejoiced. <laughs> and we've transformed reproductive health from looking at one protein in the blood. We now have the ability to look at all of them. And this is a new technology that have come about. And so the onus is going to be is figuring out who should get what drug and when and how they're working. You know, Walter talked about these great new molecular targeted therapies. And they're here. The problem comes, if you have a three centimeter cancer and I give you one of these drugs, you come back to me three months later and it's four centimeter, did the drug work? Would your cancer have been 10 centimeters? That's the biggest problem I face now in cancer. I don't know when drugs are working. So these technologies are real. They're happening. It's, you know, at age 50, we're all taught to get colonoscopy. And obviously, it ain't a fun test. Only 16% of people who should get it, get it, do get it. In the Europe, that number is 
Colon cancer is still the number three killer in, in the world in, in, in terms of cancer. And you know, it's kind of barbaric in a sense. Wh why shouldn't we have a blood test to say if you have a colonic polyp? And then you should have colonoscopy and take it out. You also have a quality metric, right? Mm -hmm. Did you get it out or not? And so these are technologies that are here now that are going to come to fruition. The problem is, one of the biggest things holding it back is, when the FDA was established, um, remember, FDA only does what Congress says it can do. Proteomics, genomics didn't exist. And so now it's not clear who regulates these areas because it wasn't in the, the act that created the FDA. And so when it's not clear the regulation, the capital markets say, listen, I'm not going to put money into an area when I don't know the rules yet because the risk may be too high and I don't really know how to calculate my risk reward so you keep money out of it. So for the last decade, this field has been shut to the capital, from the capital markets. Mm -hmm. And it's a big problem we're dealing with. Uh, yes, ma'am, yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to go back to a systems question, and yes. I wanted to get back to healthcare financing and the relationship to health reform. And I'm challenging, I guess, actually also the Aspen Institute, because I, as I wrote to you before, um, we can't have an end to illness in this country, even let alone the world, till we change delivery of healthcare to people living in poverty and remove barriers to access and in addition to financing all of these kinds of things. So I'm wondering if you are going to think at the Aspen Institute of taking all of this end to illness information and healthcare information and translating that into also a campaign to educate, remove barriers to access and change how poverty is faced in this country with healthcare. Mm. Well, you well, work for Aspen Institute. <laughs> oh, David. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, is there an answer you want to give? Or, I mean, not, you may have a lot. You, you, I mean, you're right, is that we have to look at both angles of it. And certainly, healthcare delivery, you know, the, the inability to access the healthcare system. At the same point, we have to look at, you know, educating on the prevention side. And again, if it's $2.21 <laughs> a year, we'll reduce uh, 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 cancer by 35% and delay heart disease. We have to push on those angles, whether it be part of health insurance or not. And at the same point, we have to look at how we think about health and how we approach it. We have to empower with information. We have to teach young kids in school about disease, not about the nucleus and the chromosomes. We have to get them to understand that. You know, I tried to get my kids to stop drinking chocolate milk, and I couldn't get them to do it. I told them about insulin, glucose. They laughed at me. They then watched this goofball, and I say that again nicely, named Jamie Oliver on TV, who showed them that you know, if an entire school had one glass of chocolate milk, it would fill up an entire school bus of sugar, and they opened the door of the school book, all the sugar came out. My kids don't drink chocolate milk anymore. Yay. And it's fantastic. And I, I couldn't do it for all the science in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to get education out there and look at the different groups that we're attaching it to, whether it be the inner city, whether it be the, the wealthy, whether it be the children, whether it be the adults, and each of them need to be taught differently and approached differently. And I truly believe through education we can make an impact on health. We have trouble doing health care programs here, some because they keep hiring the people who run them and then get jobs in the uh, current administration. That said, <laughs> Peggy Clark uh, still runs our global health program, and I think global health is a truly important thing because it's not just about us. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for coming today. Um, my question is off the title of your book. And if we actually do make real progress, as you suggest, toward ending illness, then what should the healthcare system of the future be prepared for? What should we be doing now to get ready for a radically different uh, series of health challenges? Because presumably people will die from something. Yeah, it's, it, it's funny. I presented this in Davos this year at the World Economic Forum, and a, a, a Treasury Secretary that remains unnamed got up and said, Agus, you can't do this. The current pension systems are meant for X percent to die in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. If you do that, you're going to screw things up. And the response back was, you know, with bioterrorism, global warming, and other things, it's going to take the place of disease. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, our, our healthcare system is, you know, we're the number one spender in the world, yet we're ranked 32nd. And so obviously that's not a healthcare finance problem, it's a healthcare problem. You know, the average time on a health plan in the United States is about four years. So Walter's plan says, listen, Walter, on average, isn't going to have his heart attack till 10 years from now, so why should I care about his prevention when he's going to be in somebody else's plan? So we need to build in incentives for prevention. We need to build in uh, plans that actually push people to do things that will prevent and delay disease. So to me, healthcare system in the future is not about end-of-life care, which it is today. Close to 70% of healthcare dollars are spent in the last two years of life. It's going to be about midlife care, early life care, about education. We have to change that. Then we have to switch into the data generation mode, right? You know, uh, if you go to Walmart, 
today, you know, everything you do is being monitored. And then they sell that information to people who give them products and they learn how to market better and do things better. But we don't have a common language in my field. You call it a broken leg, you call it a fractured leg. So the government is putting 19 billion this year out to electronic medical records, and yet we don't have standardized nomenclature yet. So how are we gonna learn and improve what we do if we don't even know what to call it yet? You know, there's a great experiment done by a guy named Larry Brilliant, who was at the time at Google.org. And he said, listen, if you got the flu or got sick, you would search for about 25 different things. You'd search for fever, runny nose, Tylenol, whatever else you would search for. So he looked where those terms went up in frequency of searching, and he was able to tell almost a month before the CDC where flu outbreaks were happening yeah. based on what people were searching. And in a remote village of China, he can know there's a flu outbreak there. With enough data, error goes away. So to me, the healthcare system of the future is going to be iterative. You go to Google and you search today, it's better than the search yesterday. It saw how people searched those terms and it made a search better, a hierarchy based on where you went and what you did. I want healthcare to be the same. That climate modeler looks at the shape of that cloud, looks at the temperature, the wind speed, and he or she can predict the future because all the information is there in a downstream readout. I want that same climate modeling principle attached to health. But that does demand getting rid of our weird obsession with privacy and anonymity. No question about it, is that you know, people have to be heroes and say, right. I want to be part of the future. Correct. I want to you know, understand that I can go online and go to Wells Fargo and I can transfer money or pay a bill and putting my healthcare information into a research database <laughs> with the appropriate securities is not something we need to be afraid of. Correct. Yeah. So, no. Ralph. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so until about three weeks ago, I was religiously taking my low-dose aspirin every day, and then a study comes out in the New York Times and says, actually, the chance of a bleed outweighs any possible benefit or, or counterbalances any possible benefit to your heart. So I stopped taking it. Uh, you were calling sleeper granola turns out to cause cancer. There's something to this joke, which is that from the consumer's point of view, yeah. it's very hard ever to get a straight story that lasts more than 10 minutes. I hear you say all these things today. How do I know that in three weeks from now, someone won't be... So this is why I wrote the book. <laughs> and um, and this is... You're, you're totally right. Is that what you need to realize is not, not all medicine information is equal. It matters how big the study is, where it was published, who it was done in, does it apply to you? And so, you know, what you're referring to is a small epidemiologic study that looked at uh, data, again, that was somewhat inconclusive, and it was not in a well-done journal. So it wasn't in the New England journals, the science, the nature, the journals you've heard of. It was in a, a pay-for-play journal. You pay 100 bucks, we publish your article. So that's not equal to a New England Journal of Medicine paper that has 20,000 people with 20 years follow-up. And so the difficult part is, yes, we don't have... A, an elder statesman of healthcare in the United States. We don't have father figures who say, listen, this is right and this is wrong. Instead, we have TV personalities, we have the news that pick up a press release from any journal and put it out there as if they're all equal. We need to build a system where we have these figures, where we have a hierarchy of information of what's real and what's not, because you're right, it is confusing. When that comes out, I get thousands of phone calls to my office. It all shuts down the phone boards when a study comes out showing something. Let me just say one quick thing, because we were, or I was in the same trade you're in. I think uh, journalism and the decline of serious journalism has been somewhat hurtful here, mm -hmm. because it used to be uh, Gina Collada's, whatever you may think of her piece, mm -hmm. at least she, you know, was yep. a serious reporter. When you start losing the New York Times, Washington Post, and others having really great health reporters, you'll just get, oh, a press release came out saying that, you know, vitamin D supplements give you, make you taller, and boom, it's a page one. So there are five dedicated health reporters in the United States oh, well. today at major newspapers. Yeah, and that should 31% be... 31% of the U.S. economy, five reporters. Yeah. Uh, another question about inflammation. Uh, in asking a orthopedic surgeon friend whether I should take uh, chondroitin for my knees... He said he thought there was some evidence that it did some good, but in fact is simply an anti-inflammatory. Do you think that's true, and do you put it in the same category as aspirin or statins that over the long term it actually can provide some benefit by reducing inflammation? So chondroitin is a supplement that people take uh, supposedly to help reduce the inflammation in joints. There have been seven randomized studies with more than 1,000 people with chondroitin, and from one that was in New England Journal of Medicine with over 15,000 individuals, none of which showed a benefit. That doesn't mean there's not a benefit for the individual. What it means is for the general population in an unselected group, taking that doesn't help. So what I say to people is, listen, if you really want to take it, 
mark down exactly the pain you feel for a couple of weeks, take it for a month. If that pain is dramatically better, it's doing something to you. If the pain is no different, it's probably not beneficial to you and I would stop it. And if you need a good knee doctor, Alma and I <laughs> Tony Unger on case. Yes, sir. <laughs> The takeaway for me of this session is talk to your doctor. But my experience is the doctors don't want to talk. They don't have the time, and many times they don't know. They give you generalized advice, like if, you're, if you can't sleep, they ask you, you know, are you drinking before you go to sleep or something like that. So talking to the doctor isn't necessarily the solution. Well, I, you know, one of the things we did in the book was we created this four-page questionnaire that I want you to fill out and gather all this information and know everything going into your doctor. So you're armed with the data. And listen, if your doctor doesn't want to talk, switch doctors. Again, we need a grassroots movement to change medicine. We're not going to change doctors. We're as pig-headed as you get. But the grassroots side can certainly change it and will change it. The, if you look for new technologies in medicine, until you get 25% adopted by physicians, 14 years on average. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So omega-3 supplementation makes sense, except that, you know, in that, you know, these are oils that are good for you. But there was a study that came out, again, in one of the great medical journals with over 15,000 women showing that a 15% higher cancer rate in women who took omega-3 supplementations. So one of the things we talk about in the book is if you, uh, uh, you know, take fish oil capsules, you know, it tried to reproduce the data from the Harvard Health study that cold water fish had a benefit on health. One four-ounce serving of salmon equals 14 fish oil capsules. If you are a fisherman and you have a beautiful fish, you sell it to the seafood store, whatever the fancy one is in Washington, for $20 a pound. Mm. If you uh, have an ugly-looking degraded fish, you give it to the fish oil company. Eat real food. Yeah. That's the old Michael Pollan thing, which is what you repeat Michael often. Pollan is the greatest book on food I've ever seen, or Michael Pollan's book called In Defense of Food. It is yeah. remarkably well done. But it's eat real food in moderation, mainly plants. Yes, ma'am. Happens when one of the things that happens probably to all women who reach a certain age is that they, they are told they might get osteoporosis. And there yep. are drugs they are given to avoid getting osteoporosis. And then you find out the next year there are all these side effects. And there's a cascade of side effects from everything you take. This is just one exa example. What do you think of that? So you're right. I mean, osteoporosis is in general genetic disease. It is not a disease of poor nutrition or lack of calcium intake or vitamin D. It is a genetic disease. And um, if you look at it, yes, we have drugs that can reverse osteoporosis. Every drug has a side effect, no question about it. But, for example, there's a drug that once a year, a shot in the arm, eliminates osteoporosis. At the same point, it also reduces your risk of colon cancer by 45% and breast cancer by 35%. But there are side effects. If you have bone evasive dental work, you can get lack of healing, and we call osteonecrosis to the jaw. It's rare. If you screen and go to a dentist first, it almost never happens. Yet hip fractures happen dramatically in this country. So you have to weigh risks and benefits and discuss with your doctor, what is my chance based on my bone density of, of having a fracture? What is the chance of complication from a medicine? And weigh them. There's no free ride. I wish there were, but you've got to weigh them. And it's a statistical argument based on your value system. And if you say, listen, if I fracture my hip, it's going to have so much of a decline for a decade on quality of life, I'm willing to take a 0.03% chance of this happening to my jaw in order to prevent that because I have an 18% chance because I'm two standard deviations off norm of osteoporosis. So, I mean, I think we can make these educated, but they're not free. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the very instructive um, talk. What I, and this is my comment very briefly, what I take from the talk is really the fact that, look, we don't know. You put all those uh, vitamins or whatever chemicals in your body, you don't, we don't really know what's happening. And really my conclusion is almost like, well, much better not take them. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and also then I'm thinking for myself as a strategy, what is really the minimum that I should really take or do that will still give me the maximum benefits or at least that average or whatever that's good or I don't know, that's a lesson for me from yeah. your talk. Yeah. Um, thanks. Let me uh, also get the woman here, and then we're going to end it because uh, a lot of this is in the book. The book is out there, and you'll be out there. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm taking, uh, let's say, let's just pick aspirin, low-dose aspirin. Uh, let's, let's suppose I start taking it when I'm 40. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there's sort of conventional wisdom, at least, that when you take, like, uh, you hear it often with antibiotics, you, you know, you, you build up a resistance. It, or people who take pain medicine for some reason, and they have to take a stronger pain medicine and a stronger pain medicine. Are there any big studies that look at long-term yes. taking aspirin? Am I going to be taking, you know, 81 grams now and 200 grams when I'm 65? And it's a great question. Grams so the United Kingdom did a study where they looked at 65,000 individuals. If you took aspirin, 81 milligrams a day, a baby aspirin, and it's a whole different story why it's 81 milligrams because it's a pretty funny number. But if you took that for 20 years, your rate of death, not of disease, but of death of colon cancer is down 45%. Esophageal cancer down 60%. Lung cancer down 30%. This is rate of death. Prostate cancer down 20%. So we don't think there's an upregulation of the enzymes it targets. And there has been no known decrement to taking that same dose throughout a lifetime. And so, yes, there are side effects. If you have bleeding ulcers, you probably shouldn't take an aspirin unless you get this fixed first. But this is something to discuss with the doctor. But again, the data to me are overwhelming. And if we as a society want to make an impact on health, we have to look at these preventive things, given the caveat of the, uh, uh, that there are some side effects, but we have to take an aggressive stance to prevent disease. The end of illness, David Agus, thank you very much. Um, clear from the number of questions uh, how interested people are what I'm going to do is ask you if you want to buy a book, get it signed, but please don't sort of ask each one of your long questions while you're in line to sign.